Welcome to Calculus 1, Chapter 2, Section 1, the Tangent and Velocity Problems. In this video I'm going to start out using some PowerPoint slides as a PDF that were prepared for Stewart's Calculus book, 8th edition, and these slides are provided by Cengage. I would normally be using these in my classroom, but today we have them in a video for you. And then I'm going to toggle over and look at some, or at least one, homework problem that I'm going to be giving to my students, and we'll look through the process of solving one of those problems. So the tangent and velocity problem, first we'll look at velocity, and in this example, we're dropping a ball from the upper observation deck of the CN Tower in Toronto, and if you haven't been there, and you're not faint of heart, I recommend checking it out. You take this amazing glass elevator up to the top of the tower, which provides amazing views, but is remarkable because you're being blasted upwards in this glass elevator up to 450 meters. And I don't re recommend dropping a ball from the top of the tower, but if you did, we would like to try to figure out the velocity of the ball after five seconds. And distance, when being measured in meters per, well, just being measured in meters, uh, is given by this equation if we ignore uh, wind resistance and so on. So in a vacuum, our position could be calculated using this formula, and that's 4.9 meters, and we're multiplying by a number of seconds squared, and the difficulty in finding the velocity after 5 seconds is maybe that we don't have a velocity equation. Here we're looking at a position equation, and we don't have any designated time intervals. So in order to estimate the velocity, we're going to use this formula or approach for calculating average velocity, and we'll look at the average velocity between a time equaling 5 and 5.1 seconds. So velocity is equal to change in position divided by change in time, and so our denominator of 0 0.1 is 5.1 minus 5, and the change in position is being calculated using the previous position equation, plugging in 5.1 and 5 respectively. And so what we're really looking at here is change in y divided by change in x. In other words, we're calculating slope. In this case, it's change in position divided by change in time. And plugging in those values, we get an average rate of change of 49.49 meters per second, because it's distance divided by time, that's how we get those units. If we were to look at some different time intervals, for example, uh, between 5 and 6, the average velocity is calculated to be 5 point, or sorry, 53.9 seconds. And as we make the excuse me, if we make the time interval smaller, so keeping 5 as the desired point in time to find out eventually the instantaneous velocity, we'll keep squeezing that 6 closer and closer to the number 5. And as we get down to 5.001, so a very small time interval, the average velocity is calculated to be 49.0049. So it looks like the instantaneous rate of change or velocity at time equals 5 would probably be 49 seconds. So that table of values is very helpful. So the instantaneous rate of change here we're seeing can be assumed to be, or it appears to be, 49 seconds. All right, let's pop over and take a look at a homework problem. This homework problem, if I slide it down so you can read the whole thing, says that we've got a tank that's holding, or that holds 3,000 gallons of water. The water is draining from the bottom of the tank in half an hour. 
and the values in this table are showing us the volume of water remaining in the tank as time progresses. So after five minutes, we only have 2,064 gallons remaining. After 10 seconds, only 1,308 gallons remaining, and so on, all the way to the end of the half an hour when we have zero gallons remaining. And this problem says that is basically marching us through the process of calculating those average rates of change. So let's work on the first one. The initial point P that we're going to be using is uh, at 15 seconds in when there are only 750 gallons remaining. So we're seeing that data in the table. And then if that's the point P that we're using on the graph of velocity, we want to find the slopes of the secant lines. In other words, the average rates of change between point P and point Q. And Q is going to change. So we'll be looking at these different points, Q. And let's calculate an average rate of change. So I'm going to utilize this space and I'll calculate one of them and then I'll erase it and we can calculate the next one. So first, our slope, again, or we could call it average rate of change, is equal to the difference in our y values, which in this case is the difference in our v values, our volume values. So we have 750 gallons remaining in there. And after five seconds, there were still, oops, 2,000 and 64 gallons remaining. And what I've just done there is I used V of 15 minus V of 5. So again, volume after 15 seconds minus volume after 5 seconds. And we're going to divide by the change in time, which is 15 minus 5. In this case, that's 10. And we'll do some arithmetic. And we find a numerator of negative 1314 divided by our denominator of 10, which is equal to negative 131.4. So I'll write that in as our slope. Is it surprising that we have a negative slope between those two points? And I would say no, because we're progressing through time from 5 seconds in to 15 seconds in, and our volume is decreasing. So this is saying that we have an average rate of change in the volume of water remaining of negative 131.4 gallons per second, because we reduced here. So this is really being divided by one. So this is uh, gallons per second. And it's negative because the volume is decreasing. All right, I'm not going to drag you through all of that arithmetic. Uh, maybe I'll actually pop you through one more uh, iteration of this because the value, the time value of 15 seconds is obviously in here in this list of Q values. So let's do one where we end up, or where we're using a time value instead of five, which is uh, an, an earlier time slot compared to the 15 seconds in. Let's calculate the one for 25 seconds. All right, so let me switch the order of the way that I was writing that. Let's look at our volume this time, five seconds in, and we'll be subtracting this time our volume when we are, let's do 25 seconds in. Oh, sorry, our point P is 15 seconds in. There we go. And we're dividing this time by 15 minus 25. Our volume 15 seconds in is still 750 gallons remaining in the tank minus 
when we're 25 seconds into this draining process, we only have 78 gallons left in the tank. And the difference in our time values, 15 minus 25, is negative 10 this time. And let's see what we get as our average rate of change. I have 750 minus 78 gallons. That gives us 672 gallons divided by a change in time of negative 10. And this gives us our average rate of change as negative 67.2. And I'll tell you or remind you again that that is gallons per second. So on that time interval from 15 seconds into the draining process to the point where we're 25 seconds into the draining process, the average rate of change in the volume of water remaining in the tank is a loss of 67.2 gallons per second, leaving the tank. That's the loss. So let's write that in, negative 67.2. And then you can go through and calculate the rest of those for yourself. So depending on what the numbers are in your homework assignment, you'll get some different numbers. And I'm going to go in and fill in the rest of these for us, and then we'll talk about part B. All right, so I've filled in the rest of those table values, and once we're at this point, and we have all of those rates of change between our time of 15 seconds and the various other times that are described by those different points in the draining process, uh, described as point Q, we move on to the part B, which asks us to estimate the slope of the tangent line. And what we're really being asked for is the instantaneous rate of change in the draining process at point P. In other words, at the point where we're 15 seconds into the draining process. And we're going to do that by averaging the slopes of the two adjacent secant lines. And since 15 was the time that we were most interested in, which is between 10 and 20, we're going to average these two values. So for part B, <coughs> excuse me, let's take negative 111.6. And how do we find the average of two numbers? We add them together. So this is our first number. We're going to add the other adjacent value, which is negative 83.4. And we're going to divide by the number of numbers, which is 2. Don't be tempted to divide by 10. This is a different process. All we're doing is finding the average of two slopes. And doing this subtraction in the numerator, we get a value of negative 194.4. And then we're going to divide that by 2. And we get a final answer of negative 97.2. And so it's still an approximation, but it's definitely a more accurate approximation than the negative 111 or the negative 83. So we're going to say, and do we have instructions for rounding here? Round your answer to one decimal place. We're already at one decimal place. So I'm going to type in an answer of negative 97.2. And that should get you started on answering your version of this question. To get a more accurate approximation, instead of using these values of 10 and 20, and we'll be doing this later in the course, instead of using these two time values, which are minus 5 seconds and plus 5 seconds away from our desired investigation point or time, which is 15 seconds into the draining process, instead of using the 10 and the 20 right here, I would strongly consider using 14 and 16. That way there's only a difference of plus or minus one on either sides of the desired time for which we're trying to find the slope of the tangent line or the instantaneous rate of change in water volume. The other homework problem that I'm assigning is about a ball that's being thrown into the air with a velocity of 36 feet per second its height, so that's another position equation, is being described by this equation. And we want to find the average velocity for the time period beginning when t equals 2 and lasting for each of the following. 
So our position, which I'm going to call s instead of y equals, so you could put a little note in here that we're going to describe y equals as s of t equals beginning at time equals 2, I'm going to calculate s of 2. In our previous problem, that would be equivalent to s of 15. So that was our sort of target point. And then we calculated the average rates of change based on differences from that as a starting point. s of 2 here is equal to 36 times the 2 minus 16 times 2 squared. And we're seeing this as a 16 in here instead of a 4.9 because we're measuring using feet now instead of meters. So let's do this quick calculation. 36 times 2 is definitely 72. And then we'll subtract the 16 times 4 and we get a value of 8. So this is a position equation. And what this tells me is that two seconds after throwing this ball into the air, it's at a height of eight feet. And I'm going to put feet on here just to remind me that I'm working with position. And then we want to find the average velocity for the time period beginning with t equals two and lasting for each of the following. So after 0.5 seconds, the ball is now 2.5 seconds into its flight path. And to calculate the average rate of change, we're going to need s of 2.5. So I will go through and calculate the position for that one. All right, so let's see. We're going to take 36 and multiply it by 2.5. And then we'll subtract 16 times 2.5 squared. And that gives us a position of negative 10. Which means that after two and a half seconds, the ball has fallen below its original starting point. So maybe we're standing on the edge of a cliff or maybe we're back on the CN tower. And that's okay. We can still calculate change in position. So we've got S of two minus s of 2.5 and we'll divide by the change in time which is 2 minus 2.5 this is equal to 8 was our position at time 2 minus negative 10 our position at 2.5 seconds into flight and we'll divide by 0 0.5 so this is <clears throat> 18 divided by 0 0.5 which is 36. So I'll write in my 36, and that means that we have an average velocity or an average change in position per time, change in position per unit of time is a description of velocity. So we're looking at a velocity here of 36 feet per second. We want to go through those same motions to find the average rate of change between 2 seconds and 2.1 seconds into the flight of this ball. So let's do that in a different color. We'll calculate S of 2.1, and that's equal to, or we're going to find that by taking the 36 and multiplying it by 2.1, and we'll subtract 16 times 2.1 squared and that gives us a new position of 5.04 and then we can calculate our average rate of change or velocity so I'm going to actually come back up and call this average average velocity equals because that's what we were calculating there and now we're going to calculate a new average velocity. So this new average velocity will equal s of 2 minus s of 2.1. And we'll divide that by our change in time, 
which is 2 minus 2.1, which is equal to our original position after two seconds of flight was eight feet above us, minus this time we have a position that is 5.04 feet above the starting point uh, of wherever the ball was. Not the starting point from when we threw it. Remember, we're starting two seconds into the flight, and now we're going 2.1 seconds into the flight. So it appears that after two seconds, one, two, our ball was up here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, was up here at eight feet. And after 2.1 seconds, the ball has actually fallen down here to 5.04 feet above the initial launching point. And 2 minus 2.1 is negative 0 0.1. Uh, that makes more sense. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to go back up into the green arithmetic because 2 minus 2.5, while it is a difference of 0 0.5, it needs to be a, uh, a difference of negative 0 0.5. Obviously, 2 mi minus 2.5 is a negative value. And what that does is it changes the denominator on the next line down to negative 0 0.5, which makes the average rate of change negative 36. So come back over here into our answer options, and I should have written down negative 36. Why does that make sense? Uh, 2.5 seconds into our flight, if you look at this beautiful graph that I drew down here, 2.5 seconds into our flight, the ball is like down here. And the slope certainly between those two points is negative as well it should be. So we have an average velocity of 30 feet, uh, 36 feet per second for part one of this answer, but the negative tells us that it's a, it's, the ball is moving in a downward direction. All right, the arithmetic back in red, let's wrap this up. This is equal to 3.04 divided by negative 0 0.1 and that gives us a final value of negative 30.4 and that's uh, an average velocity it's negative so it means we're still moving in the downward direction except it's a little bit more slowly moving in the downward direction does that make sense to us at this uh, point that I drew on my beautiful graph here, this slope, the slope of that line, does look less negative than the slope of this line for the work that we did in green for our point that was 2.5 seconds into flight. It's not letting me erase individual pen strokes there. Uh, so let's see, let's write in this answer. Uh, I was doing that work in red, so let me write in my answer in red over here. Negative 30.4 feet per second. And then I'll go in and fill in those other two values and then we'll talk about part B. All right, so I filled in the rest of the answer values and Remember that what's happening as we make this difference between 2 seconds and 2.5 seconds. Then we went to 2 seconds and 2.1 seconds. And then in our third task, we had the difference between 2 and 2.05 seconds and 2.01 seconds. So these points that I'm drawing in my beautiful graph down here are getting closer and closer to the original point where we were two seconds into the, the flight of the ball. And as a result, where this average rate of change was quite steep in the negative direction, the subsequent ones are getting slightly less and less steep. 
So we're finding the slope of a line between two points that are graphically closer and closer together. The difference in their x-coordinates is less and less. And if we look at the pattern, as we squeeze those two points in time closer and closer to each other, and we examine the pattern and the average rates of change between those two points in time, as far as velocity is concerned, it looks to me we're starting with negative 36 down to negative 30 something, down to negative 28.8. And when we look at the average rate of change between these two points in time that are only 0.01 seconds apart, it looks like that average rate of change is tending toward negative 28. And I would be willing to bet that if you did this exercise one more time and you changed this value, changed this value of 0 0.1 and you made it 0 0.0001, I bet you would end up with negative 28.0 something. It would get even closer to the number negative 28. So our estimation of the instantaneous velocity when t is equal to 2, I think we can safely say that that is 28. Why don't we just go directly to task number 4 here where we're looking at the average rate of change between two input values that are even closer together. Well, for one, the, the process of seeing the pattern is important for the learning process. And for two, what we're doing is we're mimicking the process of taking a limit. And remember that when you evaluate a limit, what you're looking for is um, what's happening in the neighborhood of a particular event or in the neighborhood of a particular point in time. So here we're approaching that neighborhood slowly. First we're starting 0.5 seconds away from our actual destination so to speak and then we're getting a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer. But we never actually get there. But what we're able to do by looking at the trend is to make a pretty educated guess about what's actually going on if we were to arrive at our destination. And in this case, our destination is finding the instantaneous velocity at a particular point in time in the flight path of a ball. There are, of course, more realistic and valuable applications. However, we have to start somewhere, so we start with these slightly easier examples, and then we apply them to even more meaningful real-life situations. Hopefully that gives you an understanding conceptually of what it is that's going on, and we will keep going through these processes until we finally get to the point where we can take a shortcut and go directly to the instantaneous rate of change. And that process is right around the corner, so hang in there, and I'll see you next time.